pleasure to be here. I think this is, uh, when I heard about this idea uh, a couple of months ago, I thought it was, it was really quite impressive and uh, uh, incredibly useful. And I think that's something that a lot of us are always searching for. Um, if you're uh, an academic and you're an academic for a long time, you start to recognize that, that purely the acquisition, handling, and regurgitation of knowledge, although it's something we get credit for as academics, sometimes isn't really all that fulfilling. And it's really nice to, to do many things that are just plain old useful uh, and get the feeling when you're done with them that you've done something that has value. And so I think this is a great weekend opportunity to do that. I think it also will be opening up your eyes to opportunities of what's going to be happening into the future. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that's being done with a, a new organization here at the University of Michigan called Distributed Health Technologies. Um, we uh, were one of a small number of groups that uh, put a proposal into the university to use some of the new space that's available at North Campus Research Complex, the former Pfizer uh, facility. And so we have uh, space allocated uh, for these ideas. Uh, to work on them and to have faculty members and staff members become part of distributed health technologies and see if we can start a new set of concepts um, working. And the reason why I think it's important for me to tell you about some of this is it's, it's purely technology based, it's not information based. But uh, one of our major goals with the technologies that we're trying to develop is the acquisition of lots of information, lots of data. And we're going on the assumption that at some point in time we will have a vast amount of extremely high quality information about health and healthcare delivery. And we're assuming that somebody's going to be able to figure out what to do with it. Uh, and that's because I'm not really an information person. I know that information is important as a scientist, but how much information we're talking about and the strategies for dealing with that information are really beyond my knowledge. But it's great to be working at a university where you know somebody else has got your back. Like my set of ignorances is covered by knowledge sets of a variety of other people that are around here. Hopefully, I'm covering somebody else's ignorance area. And I think that's really one of the fun things about being at the University of Michigan, being at a large university in general, but definitely being at the University of Michigan, is this notion of developing collaborations that have a common idea, and the individuals are covering for each other in their ignorance. So I'm hoping to show you some stuff that I think will be happening into the future and encourage you to be thinking about that in the way that you're developing your plans for how you're learning and training yourselves at, these, at this point. Um, I'll stick around afterwards for a while uh, during lunch if people want to chat a little bit about this. I'd like to hear your guys' presentations too to see how this has turned out so far uh, for the first data dive. Okay, so we'll get right into this is distributed health technologies. And I'll kind of give you a quick overview of what we're talking about. Um, again, this is originally developed from the concept of healthcare and healthcare delivery, that particular kind of information that's involved in healthcare. And so we're a set of people who are involved in developing technology. So how can technology be developed that connect people with their healthcare and healthcare system? So what are the features of human health and healthcare delivery that drive technology development? We know that the technologies that are available to us now in uh, accessing information about health and dealing with healthcare are different than the ones that were 30 or 40 years ago. How did this happen? What was the progression of which healthcare technologies have become commonplace in our lives and which ones have not? And how can healthcare technology communicate uh, with uh, advances in informatics and communication? I think this is really where the set of people that we've got here in this room might be thinking about some of the technologies we're doing. And the last thing that I've always found fascinating, and always being sort of a, a, a tool user, and, as well as a little bit of a tool maker, and living in southeastern lower Michigan is mass production uh, and how we have the ability to make large numbers of objects and how the cost of those individual objects drops actually as you make them more pervasive. This has always been a fascinating idea that very good objects, very good technologies, when they're only used by a small number of individuals are actually quite expensive. But those same technologies, when they're brought into a larger arena, there are more individuals using them, the cost drops a lot. And that's kind of a neat thing, because now technologies that are really about the average human being, or the every person out there, are really the ones that have the greatest power when we're talking about technology development. Not the specific purpose ones that are only for a small segment of the population, but the ones with the widest distribution actually have the greatest possible power. Okay. So we've kind of focused on the idea of the healthcare system, at least to begin with, with the distributed health technologies. 
And information is what we're curious about. How information is handled in the healthcare system. And the way that it works now is that there's a hierarchy in the healthcare system. And anybody who's ever interacted with the healthcare system, and I'm assuming many of you have, understands how this, this happens. And information <laughs> moves within the system. And there's a formalized way of having information move through the healthcare system. So you begin with an initial person that you interact with in the healthcare system. For example, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant. That individual will now starts to capture information from the patient when they enter into the healthcare system. That information now is encoded in a particular way, and there are quality measures associated with the way this person captures that information. The nurse or the physician's assistant has been trained in how to obtain the information, write it down, or log it into a computer, and communicate it to the next level. And often the next level is a primary care physician. This is an individual with a broad set of knowledge, but not particularly deep in any one area. They take the information from the other healthcare providers, process it in their brains, and move on to the next step in the process. Often this requires them going to some sort of a primary special, specialist. If they see a patient, and that patient's healthcare issues, the suite of information that they've captured from that person, the symptoms that they see in that person, are beyond their skill set, they package up that information in a formalized way, hand it off to the next person in the healthcare hierarchy. In this case, I'll talk about some sort of primary specialist, uh, a, uh, a pediatrician, a pediatric oncologist, let's say. And then, oops, wrong button. Often that has to go to yet another specialist. So that person will look at the information, recognize that they are also limited in their ability to process that information, understand what's going on, and they move on and give that information to a higher level specialist in their system. And finally, often here at a place like the University of Michigan, the University of Michigan Hospital, there is a tertiary care specialist. So that big blue helicopter that you see flying across occasionally on campus, that is often somebody coming from another high quality hospital somewhere else in the state of Michigan. And they, have, they do not have the set of individuals or the set of resources available at that hospital to deal with that person's illness. They're then flown here to this very special facility that we have at the University of Michigan. Not only is that human being flown here, but all the data that's been acquired on what's happened to that individual over time also has to be brought here. And that information has to be clear to the tertiary specialist who has never seen this patient before, has never interacted with them, they may have been coming from the UP or wherever, and yet they still have to have high quality information and rapidly make precise healthcare decisions at this very highest level. And often that information has come through multiple individuals before it's arrived at them. You shouldn't have to worry about all this stuff. Right? There's a formalized, organized way of doing this. That the healthcare system has been doing this for a long time, and it's pretty darn good at it. Not great, but pretty darn good at it. There are still errors that creep into the system. There are still things that are written down by hand in some horrible physician's handwriting that then have to be interpreted by yet another physician. So there are errors in here, there are problems, but for the most part, that's a high quality information transfer system. Okay. So at each level, we have healthcare professionals that assess the patient, acquire information, they recognize their own skill and knowledge limits when they look at that patient, they transfer that patient to a more specialized professional in the hierarchy, and then they hand over the accumulated patient information to that next level of hierarchy. It's all relatively formalized. Each professional in the system is trained to accurately transfer patient information to that next level. That's the key to this process. And the handoff of information is formalized. Right? Because if you don't do this right, we have errors that creep into the system, we have people be having the wrong kidney removed or whatever the problem is, you have to do, do this well. And so there's a lot of skill in doing this. Information quality is what's important and that's maintained and is traceable back through time for that individual. However, there are levels that are prior to that first trained professional when someone enters into the healthcare system. Patients are measuring their own healthcare status continually. Right? You're always monitoring how well you're feeling. You're monitoring how your children are feeling. You're taking their temperature. You're seeing what kind of patterns you have in, the, in how your child uh, uh, deals with their daily struggles. And so they have to decide on themselves whether they want to go into the hospital or not, whether they want to enter into the healthcare system. And so there's this large set of data that is accumulated at the level of the individual or at the level of the family that is used to make that initial decision to enter into the healthcare system. So you refer yourself. And so these are the questions that people are constantly asking themselves. Do I need to schedule an appointment with my doctor? Do I need to go to the emergency room? 
you ask also other people about this. There's often a second non-professional level in here, somebody who has maybe experience or a moderate level of skills that somebody's going to be asking about, do I need to go to this next level? Do I need to enter into the healthcare system? Okay. So we see that there's information collected, but it's a very different kind of information from the set of information that happens once you enter into the healthcare system. The quality of transfer of this information from the non-professional levels, professional levels, is unfortunately highly variable and informal. And then the first levels of the healthcare system knows this. So there's a gap. There's a gap in the data transfer efficiency and quality from the first level uh, of interaction with the individual to the healthcare system. Okay. And so one of the things that distributed healthcare technologies is involved in is this idea of building something that can fill in this gap. Can we make high quality? physician-approved but patient-accessible healthcare data access technologies that can fill the information gap. How do we empower the average individual to collect high-quality information that can now be easily translated into the healthcare system? So we have knowledge about that individual's health outside of the healthcare system, but it's approved by the healthcare system. So that when it's brought in, there's a quality level that we know is going to be accurate. So the medical information gap I think, and many of the people that I'm working with, can be solved by advanced sensor technologies that are being developed now. There are new computational, uh, uh, very powerful computational systems that are available, new software, new communication tools that are becoming available driven by the consumer product sector. And a large number of people that are interested in these things as, computer, as consumer products that we can take advantage of to now have attached onto it uh, healthcare information from the individual. There are four critical features we need to be thinking about. One is it's got to be quality assured collection of these physiological data. It's all about quality. The physician who is the target, or the healthcare system individual who is the target of this information, needs to believe in it. Needs to believe that the quality is high enough to be used in their regular decision making. So we need error-free data transfer to healthcare professionals from outside the healthcare system. In order for really to permeate into the average person's life, the way that we can get it into the healthcare uh, organization of what we're doing, we have to have low capital costs for each of these kinds of technologies and low recurring costs for maintaining them. And we have to include in it uh, some method for training the individual, training the patients and healthcare professionals for using this sort of data collection correctly. So the fun thing is that every person in the population does have a potential to obtain and communicate inexpensive, high-quality data to the healthcare system. People are constantly doing relatively high-technology uh, operations in their daily lives. And so they are already pre-adapted in a lot of ways to doing these sorts of things. And little pieces of equipment like this, right, which is convenient with someone left up here, has, has the ability to get people interested and begin the process of acquiring data and transferring it easily. Um, the other thing is that everybody has a vested interest in this. Everybody wants their healthcare information to be recorded correctly. Everybody wants to be part of the healthcare system. Everybody wants to know that their health is being monitored correctly. So we think that technologies can be developed that incorporate the patient as part of the healthcare information stream. There's no reason to have a gap anymore in the information between the individual and the start of the healthcare system. All the, any technology that captures human health information will work for all humans. That's a really cool thing about being a geneticist, is I know that when I look out into this audience, you're all pretty much the same, right? Sorry, you may think you're unique and individuals, but I know from a genetic variation standpoint that, that everybody in this room. Okay, now that's kind of scary, because you look at those four people and they all look the same. But they're standing up in the trees, or sitting in the trees, looking down at us and saying, you know what, they all look the same. <laughs> and they are more right than you are. Okay? That the genetic variability in the squirrel population is greater probably than all the genetic variation in the human population in the state of Michigan. So the idea is that we're all running off of essentially the same operating system. That means every individual, all 7 billion of us on this planet, all can access and use the same sort of healthcare technology translation technologies. So there's a very large potential demand for health technologies, and it's already here. Okay. So technologies capture health information are valuable for all humans because of this. In 2011, our demand is about 300 million people in the United States, about a, a, a billion people in developed nations that have access to relatively strong levels of technology and information communication systems, and again, about 7 billion people worldwide. 
Modern technologies are designed to fit exactly into this demand structure. That modern technology unit costs decrease very rapidly with increasing numbers of units. An object that we know that the market is very small is going to cost a lot of money. An object a technology that has a very large market can be manufactured very expensively. And manufacturing strat strategies that are used currently out there in the real world reflect the unit demand. Ultra high volume demand, in other words, things that are over 10 million units can engage in very low unit cost manufacturing. There are already multiple manufacturers out there that are, that are pre adapted to building and marketing and selling uh, very complex technological pieces of information as long as the unit demand is extraordinarily high. And my classic example is the Happy Meal. Now, this may not be correct, but it's close. So, this is a McDonald's Happy Meal. And one of the Happy Meals, this got me started thinking about this, is I got a Happy Meal for my kids, and inside of it was this avatar thing. Have you ever seen one of these? Well, this thing actually has a motherboard, a motion sensor, an LED, and a battery. Okay? So I don't know if you can see all these things. You set of batteries over here, there's another little motion sensor on there, and this little LED that lights up when you shake them, and you lit up. Okay? And if you pull it out, that's what it looks like. This is absolutely incredible because these are being given away. The profit margin on this must come somehow out of that little bit of extra that they get when they sell you a Happy Meal. And it isn't a whole heck of a lot of money. How can this possibly be? How can McDonald's possibly give this level of technology away? And the reason why is that they know how many of these units they're going to get rid of every month. They can go to a manufacturer and say, I need 40 million of these. Plus or minus zero. I need 40 million of them. And I'm going to come back next month, I'm going to get another object from you that's going to be another 40 million of them. Manufacturers love this. They know exactly what the target number is going to be. The target number is over 10 million. They can set up a large scale manufacturing system just to make this thing. They don't even know what this is. Okay? And they can make these objects very, very inexpensively. So our target is to develop technologies that use the existing infrastructure for manufacturing to take advantage of this. I know that my target number here at the University of Michigan Health System is about 4 million, okay, possibly, for some unit. Probably a little bit less than that for many things that we're doing, but I know overall in the United States it's about 300 million, right? And so I have a target here that is a manufacturing range that's well within the manufacturing system here. So McDonald's pre-order is about 330 million of these, and manufacturing costs are less than a dollar per ton. And so that gets to the basic idea of what we're talking about in distributed health technology. We're looking at an enormous level of demand, but an extraordinarily complex set of demands. Human health is a very, very difficult thing to fit into. And we're, we have broken down mentally our challenge into these three areas. There are resources that are available in different environments. There are human resources, physical resources, and communication resources that are available in each type of an environment. We just want to compartmentalize. So, for example, some things that are human uh, resources are the technical skills of the people that are available, the technical skills of somebody who is a trained nurse versus somebody who is a machine tool operator. They're both highly technical skill sets, but they're different between them. We need to recognize that where we adapt these things. And there's also the additional level of medical knowledge. Many people have some knowledge of medicine, some have absolutely Physical resources, there's the infrastructure that's available, is there, is there power available, air conditioning available, refrigeration available in the location? Is there any capital investment available? Is there any ability to take new technologies into the system based on the available capital that's around? And there are communication resources. Is it easy to move objects in this environment? Can you, is there transport and supply available? Is there ability to transfer data and information? Is there? And so we can talk about places where all of these resources are high. These are easy target locations for any new technology. We have high level of technical skills available, high level of medical knowledge, high infrastructure levels, capital investment, transport, supply. A target location that we're mentally envisioning for this is something like your standard hospital or medical clinic. I know I have all these things available. I can deal with a technology that matches that set of resources that are available. But many of the places that we like to think about adding new technologies have different ranges of this. For example, there are many places that have low human information knowledge. There are good people, they know about what they do for a living every day, but they don't know a lot about medicine. They have moderately good physical resources, power available, there's refrigeration available, and often now there's very high levels of communication available. Almost everybody is carrying around a cell phone. Massive amounts of information being transferred. 
And so the way that we envision this is, like in somebody's house, or a small clinic, or uh, a pharmacy, CVS, something like that, where there are a set of resources available, but not quite at the level of a clinic. And then finally, there are the enormous number of locations that have low resources in many of these areas. And so they have low technical skills, low infrastructure, perhaps very difficult supply and communication. And these are things like out in remote areas of this country and other countries where it's very difficult to get these things. And so when we talk about distributed health technologies, <clears throat> we talk about moving through this hierarchy also. Perhaps the beginning of the technology that can be applied at our top level A and as it becomes more refined and we lower the cost of it and we develop new ways of dealing with the information and handling of it, we can move to level B and to level C eventually. So our ideas are typically to begin at level A, develop a technology that has high quality in that area, and migrate our way down through these things. And a classic example of this is something called the pulse oximeter. You know what a pulse oximeter is? So back in 1971, the first pulse oximeter was built and it looked like this. It's about the size of an old-fashioned TV set. And I don't know if you can see this woman has this big thing clipped onto her ear, right, with a wire running off of it. And it runs over to this machine here. And what this does is it records pulse, pulse rate, and blood oxygen levels. And it's done optically. So a little light shines through the ear. And just based on the light, cup, the spectrum of light coming out, you can figure out what the blood oxygen level is. Because hemoglobin changes its spectra as it's oxygenated. Well, there it is right there. Now you can buy one that looks like this. So anybody can have one of these at home, straps to the wrist, you put it on your finger, you can record yourself what, the, what your blood uh, pulse rate and oxygen levels are. There's even one that just fits out on the end of your finger for recording this. And so this is a classic example, a more recent classic example, of taking something that was a very level one, level A uh, type strategy, where this initial device was available only in major operating rooms and major healthcare centers. And by refining the same underlying technology, adapting it to a larger and larger audience, and reducing the cost of the manufacturing of it, it becomes commonplace. And in fact, does anybody have a Wii game thing at home? They're talking about putting one of these on the next generation of Wii's so that you can monitor your pulse rate as you're playing your game or whatever. So that'd be kind of fun. But that just shows you that as you drive the price down, sensor technologies become more distributed. You can have them in everybody's house if you wanted to. So this is about, I think, $70 for a pulse oximeter from one to one at home. So I'm, what I'm going to show you is sort of the first demo of the kinds of things that I'm talking about. And that is a temperature sensor. Hopefully I can get this to work. So I've got my iPad here, right? Whoops. And I have what looks like a standard earbud, but it's not a standard earbud. What we've done is we've taken we've taken the same temperature sensor that you find in your medicine cabinet where you put it in your ear and you click the button and it gets your temperature. And so you read the temperature, and then you write it down on a piece of paper, and then you call your doctor, and then you read the temperature off a piece of paper to the doctor. Is that there's an information transfer problem here, right? What we'd really like to do, I can get this work, I've got a thermometer. Nice and big. Put it in my ear. Hopefully this works. Unfortunately, it come, this comes in on the uh, audio feed, right? The uh, microphone. The data comes in. Yeah, there we go. Right. So now I can capture the data. Not only that, I can start. To, I can. I can log the data. Right. I can log the data. I can measure my temperature over time. I can have this organized by what member of my family I'm capturing the data for. And then when I'm all done, I can, nah, I should do this more often, no problem. I can now send it to my doctor. Okay, so I just hit send and it, and it has email message that is sent to my doctor with that recording of the information. So this is conceptually where we'd like to go with this, that what right now is a way for the average person to capture their temperature, and there is an inherent set of errors that could occur in transferring it to the healthcare system, you now can capture the information. It can be time stamped, data stamped, quality approved, and sent electronically into the healthcare system, and we have a record of people's temperature. So this is one of the first things we'd like to do, is work with the temperature sensor. You can imagine a variety of other sensors being added to this system, and 
and a higher, denser level of information being transferred. Okay, so that's my one little <laughs> demo. And, okay. and the last point that I'd like to make is that the kind of technologies that go into this structure, that go into making this and go into many of the things that we're using as sensors in, in society right now are the result of an investment by many companies in extremely low cost sensor technology. This includes the automotive companies that are using these to monitor your deceleration that triggers your airbag or the amount of oxygen that's coming into your engine so it can monitor the, the fuel rate increase in there. And so we have a large number of highly complex microfabricated sensors that can be linked to microprocessors to have high density of information. And then we have the ability to have digital information linked wirelessly into a communication system. So these are the new things that have come about in the last 20 years that now have been brought down in price to make them very accessible to being used as sensor technologies. The digital electronics revolution is going to dramatically change the way we interact with information. And healthcare information can be a part of that system. And so we have a large number of folks here at the University of Michigan who have been involved at the academic level in developing new types of microsensors and new types of communication systems, and we're integrating them into the idea of actually producing objects that can be used into the healthcare system as well. And I will I can just show you some of the sensors that we've got. We have microfabricated three-position axis sensors that are available. This is about uh, 150 microns on a side. Uh, acceleration can be monitored. These are all microfabricated on silicon. Air pressure can be monitored. Uh, small batteries are available. Uh, we can monitor magnetic fields even with microfabricated systems and oxygen levels. So a whole variety of sensors are already available to us for monitoring the basic physiological processes that are necessary for understanding human health. And that information can be captured at any level, including the level of people at home or people in a clinic as well as in the hospital. Um, the last thing that I wanted to show you is the thing that, that I'm currently working on now, and that's a, uh, people know what RFID is? Mm -hmm. okay. So the standard is about three cents, and it's about, it's about like this. And you can put this in the pages of your book or wherever and you can monitor. This simply has a little microchip on it, and all it really has on it is data. And it requires being put near a reader. The reader has radio waves that power this briefly, and that sends a signal back to the reader. And so your UPS guy who's walking around has, has this kind of system to it. What we've started to develop is a radio frequency system that's a little bit smaller. I don't know if you can see that little circle there. It looks like what I've got on the, on the screen here. It's got the same information handling on it, same communication chip on it. What we're adding to that communication chip is a sensor chip. So that sensor chip is just monitoring temperature at this stage. The fun thing about this is that it's quite small, it's about nine millimeters in diameter. The other fun thing is it can be manufactured in huge quantities. So these things can be made, if you can see these are rolls that are manufactured on this machine that's over here. And this drops the per unit cost to about five cents to make each one of these. And that's existing technology that's built. And what we've done with this is we've made it small enough and we've put it on a backing that is the same material that you have in stitches that dissolve over time. So the material actually uh, degrades after about two weeks. And the idea is to monitor the inside of the nasal cavity, which is a great place for monitoring temperature, breath rate, oxygen levels, uh, blood glucose levels, and is topologically on the outside of your body, right? So it's not inside your body, but it's pretty much inside your body. I don't know how to really describe it. Uh, but the idea is to get as close to being inside as possible without breaking through the barrier to get to the, to, to, um, to the bloodstream. And so this little object now can be put inside, and I know that it can be read. I took one of these, I stuck it inside my mouth, put it up next to my cheek, and the reader reads it. Right? So now not only can I get the uh, acquisition of information like temperature, but I can also get rid of this wire, right? And so what we'd like to be able to do is have systems like this that we can put either inside someone's mouth or inside their nasal cavity that are constantly acquiring information, perhaps storing that information, and then a physician or any other healthcare provider simply needs to bring the reader up next to the individual's head and you capture the information. So that's sort of where we're heading on these things, and I just wanted to end with showing you again our little 
hierarchy of information capture and target locations, and then I'm available for you guys if you have questions. My last pitch, I'm sorry, I should have made before I ended there, is that these are the kinds of things you need to be thinking about. Right? The future of information is going to be extremely high, dense, high density with lots of people in their everyday lives, and then someone's going to have to be able to deal with that information. And I am definitely not the person to do that. So <laughs> people who are working on the how do we acquire the information component with the assumption that other people will be able to handle that information. Yes? I guess my, I think this is a fascinating conversation quite awesome, but one of the things I think of early on is in a very early design stage before it's kind of widespread, and that's sort of building privacy in an early phase. Uh, yes. You know, email is generally not an encrypted, you know, medium, right, and right. I would think that it's something very important to include early on. So I think it's health, health related information needs to have a lot of security involved in it. One, actually, you know, in some ways, nice thing about these RFID uh, tags that we're making is that the read distance is only about 12 inches. So somebody has to physically still get very close to the individual. They don't have to wake them up to take their blood pressure, right? The idea is just to sort of wave this past them or have it in their pillow or something underneath, uh, underneath them during, during the night if you wanted to monitor them. But yes, it's extremely important with health information to make sure that these things are encrypted in some way and protect people. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a technical question just because okay. I'm curious. So how does the RFID <laughs> patch dissolve? after two weeks. Like, that's fascinating. Well, so, have you, have you ever had stitches? Yes, of course. I can understand the stitches, but isn't there, like, I mean, oh, there isn't other yeah, metals yeah, yeah. or yeah, something? Yeah. That, so like, this, this is, uh, where I put it? That actually has uh, aluminum. It's about 10 microns thick. Okay. Uh, and then the silicon chip is about 50 microns thick by about 150 microns on the side. So it's very small, uh, so that it's the if it when it dissolves, it sort of just rolls up and you sort of blow it out your nose. Uh, you wouldn't okay. even notice actually; it's so small. Oh wow! Right, it's the backing, right? It's the backing that's the, the the large mass of this thing. And we can make that out of polymers that are designed to degrade in a set amount of time. That's the same set of polymers that we use for for sutures. That, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's very very thin. Right? You can imagine if that, if that, if the backing all dissolved away, right. that object itself wouldn't be really a big deal, and it's relatively inert, right? It's all, it's all encapsulated in glass or silicon. And aluminum. can I pass this around? I think yeah, everyone sure. else yeah. wants to look at it. Yeah. Is <laughs> that it's not absorbed into the body? No, no. You'd have to, you'd have to blow it out your nose. And again, that's why having it out, topologically outside, is kind of nice. Um, we're still arguing about whether the best place for such a sensor is sort of up inside, you know, your lip, which isn't really that bad, or actually in the nasal cavity. You can capture more data in the nasal cavity, which is why I'm kind of pushing for that, but it's a little more creepy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be the first guy to admit. <laughs> you know. Have you ever seen those guys that, you know, nail, put a nail in their nose? Oh. See that? There's nothing to the trick, because it, your nasal cavity starts about five millimeters above the opening, so that anybody can do this. Anybody can drive a nail into their skull through their nose because it's all empty. But it's still kind of creepy. <laughs> 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 yeah. Do you have an example of um, an instance of such micro devices that might be that are being used in production in like low cost environments, something like that? Like in those you know, level three environments you mentioned. Um well, you know, the, do you mean the sensors? Yeah. Um, I mean, are, are any of these technologies actually being used in um, environments today? Um, depends on which environment you mean and which sensor you're talking about. So, um, for example, the, those, that three-axis motion sensor already exists in this thing. And it's not typically tied to medical, acts, medical information. Right, but one could easily imagine having some sort of an app on this where someone who has Parkinson's disease is asked to hold this in one hand. Right, and you see how what the level is, and then hold it in the other hand. Right. Uh, I don't think such an app exists, but that's all it would take. 
would be some software to turn this three-axis sensor into something that could monitor a healthcare outcome. Um, which is kind of a good idea. If you talk about cell phones and the cameras that are being used on cell phones, there are people that are using those cameras as a way of accessing information about skin lesions, uh, accessing information about the progression of uh, uh, pre-existing uh, moles for skin cancer. So a physician will ask you to take a photograph of something that's kind of looking at sort of skin cancer-ish. Um, you know, over a period of several weeks to ask what the progression of it is. So it depends on what you need. I think they're very crudely done right now. And what physicians are asking for, and actually the target audience here really is the healthcare system, not the individual. That what, that's what distinguishes this from sort of consumer electronics. Right. Consumer electronics are about selling this to the average person. Here the idea is to sell this to the healthcare system, to, to have them believe that the quality of information that's coming in will be as good as info, right? What will happen, yep, everybody has kids, right? You know, you call the doctor and say, my kid hasn't been feeling well, they've had a fever for the past, you know, 18 hours, and the physician goes, bring them in. Now, bring them in is a huge decision, right? Bring them in to choose up my time as a parent, right? It, it, it puts the kid at risk of interacting with a lot of other sick individuals, you know, depending how far away you live, it's a, it's a huge time commitment, and it's a huge sink on the healthcare system. You've got to bring the person in, you've got to monitor them, you've got to keep them in a the location. All for what reason? To capture high quality data. And if we could translate that high confidence, right, of high quality data to the parents, instead of bringing them in, it would save everybody a huge amount of time and problems. But you've got to convince the physician that the quality of the data that's captured at home is equivalent to if the kid came in and I had a nurse monitor that kid for a couple of hours. I have to believe it's possible. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, kind of on that note, in your discussion with other physicians at University of Michigan, what have their reactions been to this sort of technology? Their, their react, actually, that's really what's driven, driven my way of thinking about this over the past couple of years, is those, those conversations. I thought this would be easy. And then I started talking to physicians. They said, that's a really cool idea. I still wouldn't believe the information. I said, what's going to be necessary? Right, for you to get to that level. And that's when I started to realize that there has to be a training component. Right? So you have to you know, download the app. Let's just walk through that. Download the app as a parent, and then you have to go through a training process to, to show that you really know how to capture the data correctly. And then the data is captured, then it's approved for being sent in. So it's really about data quality more than anything else that drives this. There's got to be a lot of you know, internal controls on anything. Right. That right now, the temper sensor I have does not have a control, so we have to add a control system to it. Right. Did I kind of answer your questions? Yes. It's really driven by the, the targets of this are the physicians. They need to believe that this is right. This is making me think of like um, the sort of self-check apparatuses they now have at Walgreens and CVSs and stuff, right. and so like. You could also imagine a kind of situation where, you know, not every parent has necessarily the iPad with the app or whatever, but maybe there's a public place they can go that's not the hospital or the healthcare system per se, and still somehow transmit that information. Right. So now you're seeing that these high, this hierarchy levels. Right. You you can develop a technology now that has to be implemented at that higher level. Or you know, some intermediate between there, like like CBS would be between like level A and level B, it's sort of approved way of looking at it. Um, and only after it gets refined, you know, multiple iterations of the technology and the software associated with it, and increasing the number of places where it's being used, now the cost drops, right? And now you can start to move it down in levels.